Hello everyone, this is Thersites the Historian, and with me is a special guest. I figured I'd introduce the series on the life of Napoleon, but I figured it would be easier to introduce the series if I actually had the author of the series with me to talk about it. So with me right now, via Discord, is Sean Chick. You here? Good day. What'd you say? Could, what? I said, hello, how are you today? Oh, I'm fine. So, oh, fantastic. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, just the mic cut out for a second for some reason. I don't know why I did that. Um, so when you originally wrote this piece on Napoleon, what sort of drove you to do it? I wanted to essentially have an excuse to write about him because I think he's a fascinating figure. Um, and I also knew that I would never really have a chance to in a, a major book form. And several reasons for that. One, it's not my specialty, you know. Two, there are so many books about Napoleon. I mean, I mean, you have to have hey, like Abraham Lincoln and Adolf Hitler are the only people I know who can contend with having as many biographies, right? And you know, I, I didn't feel like writing. I wouldn't want to just write just another Napoleon book. But I thought, you know what? So I'm on Board Game Geek. At that, let me explain. Board Game Geek's a website where people do board games uh, and rate them and review them. And I was very active there at the time. And they had something called a geek list, which was where you could like list things about games. But sometimes people would do like geek lists about history. And so I thought I would do that, and I'd write it as a series. And each section would deal with a different part of Napoleon's life. Now, the other idea that I had for it was that um, it would also be the last list of its kind that I did. I wrote because I was backing out of that. I was getting more into actually getting to things getting professionally published. So I figured it'd be a good way to say goodbye to something that I'd done for years that had really helped me learn how to write and communicate with people because they would reply to things. You could answer them back. So I thought Napoleon was the best way to go out. But I also had my own take on Napoleon that I wanted to uh, put in some form out there. And it's not an original one, but it's one people don't talk about as much anymore. And that's the idea that Napoleon... Well, let me back up this up. A lot of contemporary books written about Napoleon, especially by British historians, portray him as a prototype to the 20th century dictator like a kind of Fidel Castro, Mao, Hitler, whatever you want to say, or in a few other rare cases as the precursor to the European Union because uh, Napoleon had similar ambitions of having a, year, a concert of Europe, if you will, with France at the center, though. And I, I thought both ideas were essentially too much based on our own timeline. If you looked at Napoleon... He doesn't know what a totalitarian dictator is. I mean, communism doesn't even exist, right? Right. So what is he, Napoleon, actually looking to? And that is enlightened monarchy. I mean, his, one of his personal heroes, easily in the top two or three for him, is Frederick the Great. And I saw him more as somebody trying to be an enlightened monarch more than anything else. And I got that idea from reading, um, I'm probably going to butcher his pronunciation, Stendhal, the, the novelist who wrote The Red and the Black. He wrote a short thing about Napoleon, and Stendhal had direct experience with Napoleon. He was on Napoleon's staff during the invasion of Russia and the retreat, and he was a big fan of Napoleon's writings. He actually based some of his own styles on that, and so his... His biography of Napoleon is not really a biography. It's more like a collection of thoughts and ruminations. And one of them that he had was that Napoleon was a great man until he decided to become a monarch. And in becoming a monarch, he, over time, started to take on the vices of monarchy, like, you know, the court life and the frivolity of court and trying to become an equal to other monarchs who, of course, will never respect you because they see you as a usurper above all. So that was essentially what I was trying to do. I wanted to get something out there about Napoleon because he fascinates me a lot. And I wanted to say something that was contrary to uh, a lot of the popular histories you see nowadays. That makes sense to me. I'm glad that you explained the whole uh, geek list concept because uh, that was something that I always edited out when I would um, copy your files into a Word document. Because I, I know, was, didn't want to have to I explain what that was. 
Oh, yeah, I thought it was worth saying just because it was essentially me saying goodbye to Board Game Geek as a way for me to write about history. Because by that time, uh, by 2012, I was working on my first book intently and thinking, I'll get this one published. That being The Battle of Petersburg, June 15th to 18th, 1864. Which, by the way, is not the title I chose. The publisher chose it because, in their words, you'll get better Google searches this way. Yeah. I mean, I guess if uh, people are doing research on the topic, and uh, then your book has a chance of popping up that way. Assuming they know the exact date of the siege, which or the battle, excuse me. But um, that's why I, I thought it was so funny. Like, no, no, we're going to call it the Battle of Petersburg with the dates. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, it's a very basic. Um, what would no you have problem. called it if you had a full uh, editorial power? That Thomas Howe wrote the first book on it, a very short book called Wasted Valor, which is just a fantastic name to describe the battle. Um, and the reason for that, just so everybody knows, is because the Battle of Petersburg that I was talking about lasted four days, and the Union, out of three of those four days, had a major numerical and positional advantage on the Confederates, and they couldn't pull it off. So part of me writing the book was me figuring out how did the Union lose this battle where they had all, so many things in their favor? And wasted valor that Tom Howe used was a great way to describe it because the troops attacked as heroically as ever, but it didn't matter. Their commanders made too many mistakes. The weather was bad. Uh, on the other end, the Confederates were bitterly determined to hold the city. Beauregard was their commander, and he was very good at defensive actions, and he, he understood what he was doing there. So wasted valor was a great title. So... I had ridiculous purple prose names, you know, like um, Slaughter at Petersburg and other stupid stuff. So yeah. in a way, I'm kind of happy that they ditched what I had, you know. Yeah. Uh, I'd, I'd have to look back in the files to find the name that I had when I raised money for the book. Oh, you know? shit. I remember when you did that because you also raised yeah. money to get the maps and all that for it. Yeah, yeah. I, man, I uh, I got to tell you, like, I was that was so impressive that I was able to raise that amount of money. And I will tell you. The ability to raise that kind of money now for a Civil War book, much more difficult. Really? Yeah, I mean, that? you got four things. You know, you got four things going on. On on the one hand, when it's your first book, everybody's way more impressed. They're like, oh, cool, your first book. I got to give you money, man. Then it's like, hey, I'm making another book. They're like, oh, that's cool. <laughs> yeah. You know, they're, 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 not, they're not as into it. And then I was able to raise some money through Board Game Geek, but Board Game Geek is a much more restrictive site right now. Back then, I could post a link and say, hey, fellow wargamers, help me out. I did that for the third book I was working on. It was deleted within minutes. Damn. It was an advertisement. Yeah. That's and kind of so, Yeah, that site's not nearly as fun as it used to be, you know? A lot of people who were on there for years, like some of the best users, they've deleted their accounts, so they're not active anymore. Yeah. But anyway... And the other thing, too, is uh, Civil War topics in general are just much more charged now. I mean, my book came out right when they were talking about things like statue removal. And if I, make, I meet somebody at a bar or something, I mention a Civil War story, and you know, you'll sometimes get bad looks or weird questions. I guess it's also right? worth mentioning that you live in New Orleans. Yeah, yeah, yeah. At the so, yeah, heart lots of, of that bars. controversy. Oh, God, I remember one woman one time, I said, uh, I'm a Civil War story, and she said, do you teach the real war? And I was like, <laughs> oh, man. And, I mean, I say that, some of you here might be thinking, what is that, like a lost cause redneck or something? I'm like, no, furthest thing from it, very much a woke person. Anyway, she ended up getting upset about stuff, and the bartender gave me a free drink and said, I'm sorry. <laughs> oh. Yeah, I mean, so I... Not I guess you've had some uh, pretty interesting dating experiences down there. Uh, I guess when you say you're a Civil a, War historian, you, uh, it's that, a good conversation not, starter. That was not a date. That was a random person came up to me and said, uh, what do you do? You know? <laughs> oh, All right, great. That's what I do. It's even more fun. But yeah, no. So when you're a Civil War historian right now, you uh, definitely have to be prepared for uh, some interesting, tense, and bizarre engagements with people. I know? think the weirdest engagements I've had, I mean, other than channels that uh, questions get on my channel about the jews uh would be back when dan brown was writing da vinci code i was an undergrad and, and people would ask me what my major is and i'd say history what kind of history ancient oh what do you think of the da vinci code uh, i haven't read it nor will i so that's what i think about it 
that's one of those book series that you know it's out and it's big, but you know that it's going to get forgotten. Like, does anybody ever mention Da Vinci Code anymore? No. No, no, just it's nothing, man. It was, it was big in the aughts, back in the Bush years, and then poof, gone. Yeah, I feel like in general, uh, the respectability of conspiracy theories probably hit its peak under Bush. And then after that, it began to fizzle out. I think, like, those kinds were pretty big. Like, the uh, like weird historical ones, in a way. Like, you know, the Templars used to run stuff kind of thing, right? Also, what's that now, one about the Russian mathematician uh, who supposedly proved that Christ was crucified in the 1200s? Uh, or maybe yeah. ten, uh, thousands? I don't remember exact date, but that was a big online discussion topic back then. Yeah, that that's, that's, um, I, I only read a little bit about him. I knew a guy who was like intrigued. He didn't believe it, but he thought, wow, now this is a conspiracy theory, you know? Yeah. And it made some sense because, you know, conspiracy theories are very popular in Russia, but of course they would be. I mean, you're a country run by the czars, then by the communists and now by Putin. I mean, yeah. You know, if you think about it, the idea that dark forces actually control things is actually the reality in Russia. Yeah, it kind of is. Um, I mean, and if you look at the way people live in Russia, it seems like they live pretty full throttle to begin with. I mean, there are all kinds of videos on the Internet of people uh, setting up metal bands on motorcycles with sidecars and just riding around the uh, outer belt of Moscow or St. Petersburg. Uh I love like, or hate Russia. You never accuse Russia of being boring. No, no, it is not. Um, <laughs> and if you live outside of the two areas that the government maintains, you probably have to get a new set of tires about every two weeks, just based on the condition of the roads. Holy hell! Oh man. So, um, why? I, I actually have a question for you, though. Why did you uh, want to do the Napoleon thing in particular? Like, there's anything that drew you to the subject? Um, I mean, I've always been fairly interested in Napoleon. Uh, I, when I was in high school, I tried to read David, the, was it the Chandler Campaigns of Napoleon book, and I didn't finish. I made it to about 1806 or so, and then I didn't really think about it again until I went to Kentucky, and then I met you, and you were telling me about Napoleon. So that's probably the next time I'd thought about that. Um, and I haven't really had too many chances to look into Napoleon, but um, you know, something I've always kind of wanted to do, but I've never really had the time to research Napoleon in any depth. So, again, people definitely ask the height about, of my. I'll oh, go ahead. You know, I was gonna say that's definitely the height of my interest in him was when you met me. You know, I'd, okay, I've still read some books since then, but not like back then. I was, and also I that was my minor was um, uh, French Revolution and Napoleon. You know, oh. uh, so I was already reading a whole bunch of books about him anyway. Nice. Anyway, you were saying? Yeah, so I mean, and I also get a bunch of questions like when I did the successors series for uh, as over a year ago now on Alexander's successors, I would get le questions about um, are you going to do a series on Napoleon's marshals? And I was thinking that'd be a great series, but I don't know how the hell to do that. So then I thought about the stuff you had posted on The Geek, and I thought, hmm. That might suffice. Yeah, uh, the the um, the old Napoleon one when I was editing it again because I was like, you know, if you're going to put it up there, I've I've written a lot more since then, and um, looking at that and the Sherman piece, you know, it's the kind of thing where you're like, oh wow, I'm like, you know, this is how I used to write, you know. And there are parts where I was like, oh, that was very good. And other parts where I was like, wait a second. I got, I got, I got to delete that. That, that, that sounds stupid. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess you that's know, a sign of growth. Well, I mean, if, if you look at stuff you read, you wrote 10 years ago and you say that was spectacular. And I, I think like you got problems, man. You're another, yeah. you know, you're uh, in decline. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you've, uh, Cause now you're like, man, I could never reproduce this brilliant prose I put on the internet 10 years ago. That was the peak. <laughs> Although, you know, to be fair, though, I found that's more the case with history writing. Like, your average uh, historian writes better as it goes on. And it's not the case with creative writing because, you know, there's so many more moving parts with that. Yeah, I think you know, I've thought about that, too, especially with creative writing. I noticed with Stephen King, who I've only gotten into the last few years, um, if you write, if you read anything he wrote after the 90s, it kind of sucks. 
And I think it's because now he's basically wealthy and more or less removed from society, so he doesn't really understand how people work anymore. And I, I feel like yeah. all his characters kind of are very similar. They're all kind of like smart alecky, uh, but they also all have a boomery vibe to them, even the ones who are supposed to be young. And so, Stephen King is King fucking Boomer in so many ways. Yeah. But I, I you know, I think part of it probably was too. Um, you know, he stopped drinking and doing a bunch of coke. Well, that was the first and second mistake. Yeah, like, like I mean, there's, I mean, not every artist, of course, right? But it's kind of like, um, it's almost like you listen to, like, Springsteen albums, right? Yeah. And after Born in the USA, he says, yeah, I started to calm, my life started to calm down. I started to calm down. I'm like, I noticed the music's not as good. Yeah. You, know, you, need, you need a touch of the crazy, you know? No, for sure. A bit of madness or something I to guess, make any of that And I guess stuff like work. with you know historians, it's sort of the opposite in the sense that over time you have more of a sense to develop your voice and feel comfortable. And uh, I feel like too with a lot of younger scholars, there's definitely a very stick neck, stiff necked approach to writing, in the sense that you worry so much about precision that uh, sometimes you don't have any flow. Because I've reread some parts of my dissertation as I've been writing it and. Uh, yeah, there's some parts that, because I'm trying to describe technical institutions, it sounds like stereo instructions, and it just doesn't sound like anything I would normally write. Yes, exactly. I mean, you can see that with so many books. Uh, Creation of the American Republic by Gordon Wood. Uh, Gordon Wood's a very good writer, but not in that book. Now, it's a great book. I mean, it's a superb piece of, um, of historical research and uh, kind of like almost like semi-political philosophy. Hmm. Like Barack Obama was a big fan of that book, for instance, it's yeah. a bit of political historical philosophy. But it is a tough read. What's oh the my uh, God, what's the try. worst written history book you've ever encountered? Oh, damn! Um, I think the absolute worst history book I've ever encountered, in every way possible, is an Osprey title. Now, you know, Osprey does the military history stuff, and their titles vary a lot. Like, some of them are fantastic, and some of them are just terrible, right? I mean, it's the quality is over the place. I do read a lot of them because, you know, you get a lot of good information about, you know, ships and other things, for instance. But anyway, so I read theirs for the Battle of New Orleans, which is read by a guy, I think his name is Timothy Pickles. That is the absolute worst history book I've ever read. Um, in fact, I can actually pull up the review here because it's. Oh shit! I'm gonna do that. I'm just gonna pull it up, man. Because you, you, okay. you, you got to hear this thing, man. All right. Okay. So I was but, worried for a second because your mic cut out, but okay, we're you're good now. No, I'm good, man. All right. Um, what? Wait. While I'm pulling this up, what, what's the worst read, read written history book you ever uh, read? No contest. It was this book by, I believe the guy's name is Jeffrey Wirt, but I might be wrong about that. He wrote a biography of Longstreet back when I was actually in the Civil War history, like, I don't know, high school, whenever. I tried to read that book, and it damn near put me to sleep after about 10 pages. It was just the most dry, desiccated prose I've ever encountered in my life. And, um, yeah, couldn't do it. Jeffrey Wirt is a rough one, for sure. Did he write other um, books, or is that the only one? Yeah, no, he's he's uh, he's written some. Of those. Probably the best Longstreet book I can think of is Lee's Tarnished Lieutenant, oh. which is very very well written, uh, very beautiful, very sad book too. You know, Longstreet's very much portrayed as this tragic, uh, forgotten character, if you will. But yeah, I did own, I did, I actually did read the Jeffrey Wirt Longstreet book, and uh, yes, it is an extremely boring book i'm sorry jeffrey if you're hearing this you know yeah i mean all you know, right. no, nothing personal but that book was uh difficult all right so here's my goodreads one this is fun british military historians are rather infamous for jingoistic prose and a narrow focus on their heroic little island but even this volume would make most shudder in fact even their rank and file might join me in calling pickles an arrogant ass <laughs> hell oscar itself rarely but occasionally goes in for this kind of dreck what we have here is a lopsided account from a wholly British point of view, made worse by a piss-poor narrative of the fighting and weird political asides. For instance, Packingham's subordinates are discussed in detail, 
but Jackson's are all but ignored in the text. Pickles takes every chance to denigrate the Americans, mention the glories of the British Empire, and then take a stab at Thomas Jefferson as a left-wing revolutionary with idiotic ideas. <laughs> he slanders the Creoles of New Orleans using language he would no doubt apply to the hated French. He replaces one set of nationalistic myths for another. If I met Pickles in the alleyway, I would not hesitate to kick him in the balls. <laughs> Did you write this? Yes, I mean every word of it. <laughs> <laughs> That's fucking great. Oh my god. I think that is the only no, that is the only review I've ever written where I was like, if I met this man, I think I might punch him. <laughs> or but I guess to truly, be fair, kick him in the balls, slightly different than punching him. Probably more effective. Better. I was I was talking to some people about Osprey titles and I had several of them mention that too. I had several of them mention like that is considered by many to be one of if not the worst title in the Osprey collection. Absolute dog shit. I don't think he. I don't think he ever wrote another book for them ever again. I hope. Like, not. I think they looked at it, published it, and then said, "Oh my god, we can never let this man in here ever again." <laughs> yeah. But to be fair, though, your average book on the Battle of New Orleans is pretty terrible. Most of them, though, are the opposite. The Pickles one's interesting because it's very pro-British, but most of them are written this very pro-American thing, you know, where we hide behind trees and shoot dumb British people as they come at us, and like that's not how it worked at all. So basically, it was a it was a, kind of like a corrective, and but it was one that replaced one horseshit version with one that might even be worse. I would say the pickles one is worse only because the prose is I mean, it's just stupefying, you know. Uh, right. The other ones are just kind of just your run the mill bad history. I have encountered one very good book on the Battle of New Orleans uh, called British at the Gates. It actually is written by a British historian. And he, he, he dodges a lot of the myths about the battle that the Americans have told over the years. He presents the battle in the context of the War of 1812 and the campaign for the Gulf. And he has a great statement about the memory of the Battle of New Orleans, because he talks about how in, in Britain, people don't really remember the War of 1812 or care, and they definitely don't care about New Orleans. And he says it's very simple. When the British, the British love celebrating battles they lose that they can spin as a victory, like Dunkirk. Right. You know? Um, whereas there is nothing in New Orleans for them. They simply came, they were slaughtered, and they left, and the war was almost over anyway. You know? Now, for people in New Orleans, the battle is important because the whole city unites to turn back the British. A large portion of Jackson's army is made up of local New Orleans men, so it's a uniting event for them. And if the British had taken New Orleans, who knows what would have happened. I mean, the war technically wasn't over. Congress had not ratified the peace. The British could have ravaged the area. They might have even burned New Orleans. I mean, armies that storm cities after losing a lot of men tend to be very poorly behaved. So Agreed. for the people of New Orleans in particular, and I'd say even America, it is an important battle. And important alone for the fact also that Andrew Jackson will become president because he wins this very lopsided victory against the British. That is probably uh, true. I can't imagine what yeah, else he'd have become famous for. Yeah, I mean, like, he had won Horseshoe Bend, um, but that was really about it. And Horseshoe Bend wasn't a big enough battle to make him a hero. Also, the fact that the, the Battle of New Orleans was so lopsided in a war that where America had lost most of the battles, you know? The most embarrassing being Queenston Heights, where we lost, like, 1,400 men. I think the British lost 100. Yeah, I know that's basically the Canadian equivalent of the Bell of New Orleans. Actually, it's yeah, almost although, their equivalent to the whole American Revolution. <laughs> although, here's the thing about Canadians, though. Like, like people are always like, oh, you know, Canada beat us in the War of 1812. I'm like, well, there really weren't that many Canadian militia units, and the ones that were there didn't really act that well. It was yeah. British regulars. They did most of the fighting. Um, so, yeah, you know. Um, not too surprised. But no, that. the... Um, Going, going, uh, going back to Napoleon. Uh, I also um, want to mention a book that I'd read after I, I wrote this, but some many people here might be interested in. It's called Napoleon the Novelist, hmm. and it talks about Napoleon as a um, as somebody who who tried to become a sh was tried to actually write short stories when he was younger and philosophical tracks, and none of them ever worked out. But he always was knew what the books were at the time. He had a personal library with him. He had read Rousseau and other works constantly. And 
the author's argument was that even though Napoleon never really became this creative writer like he had planned on, he treated his life as a novel. And Napoleon did at one point on St. Helena say, what a novel my life has been. Wow. But probably the weirdest one ever was when they're retreating from Russia, Napoleon was on a sled. When he's on this sled, he's got he's on a sled because he's tr it's all, you know, it's snow everywhere. They're trying to get to Paris as fast as possible because there had been a coup there that had failed, but Napoleon's nervous. What could be happening? He also needs to get there as fast as possible to raise a new army. Well, while they're in Germany, he finds out they're near where Goethe lives. You know, the uh, the German writer, the one who wrote Faust and Sorrows of Young Werther. And Napoleon was such a fan that he had them stop to try to find Goethe so he could talk to him. Oh, wow. Anyway, this, this man needs to rush to France to get things in order. But he's like, no, no, we can make a stop. My favorite writers in the area. I mean, to be fair to Napoleon, I mean, he did just suffer one of the worst defeats in history. I guess he did need to pick me up. Yeah, yeah. I, I, you know, a little <laughs> vacation. Yeah. He was also trying to win over other authors like uh, Chateaubriand, who's uh, just then becoming... Uh, um, so yeah, no, I think that's a, that's a wonderful book. And another one I'd say that this book really did influence the, what you're going to be reading out to people is the first total war by bell. And that's one of the best accounts of warfare at the time and how warfare was transformed into a much more brutal totalizing experience. And you know, he doesn't say that warfare before that was all lovely and nice. I mean, you got to guys getting blown to pieces by cannons and muskets probably the most one of the most gruesome things i ever read it was a um an account in matchlock combat which is the 1600s you know kind of like english civil wars franco-dutch war you right. know you got guys with pikes and the other guys have these giant matchlock muskets and you got to light a you have to light a fuse and it shoots off well the slugs of those bullets were so big that if they hit you bone would splinter outward Mm. Oh, there's one guy who writes about how they have wounded soldiers after this one battle who the reason they're wounded is from bone shattering into their faces from guys next to them. Damn. He's not saying that war was never brutal before that. What he means is that with Napoleonic Wars, you have a very ideological war, I mean, they're both French Revolution and Napoleon, and the kind of war where suddenly in Europe you're going to have mass deprivations against the populace, like you see in the Vendée in France like you'll see in Spain with Napoleon. Right. And I guess, too, a lot of the difference between Napoleon and the people who came before him was just pure scale, right? It's in terms of the number of, of men engaged and whatnot. Uh, the, the, uh, the biggest musket battle um, before Napoleon's was the Battle of um, Mal Malquette. I'm probably mispronouncing that one. That's the one where the Duke of Marlborough and Eugene of Savoy take on the French army led by uh, Claude de Villiers and Marlborough and Eugene are victorious but they suffer like 20,000 losses against the French 10,000 yeah uh, Villiers told Louis XIV um, something along the lines of um, you know if your majesty is granted another such defeat we will win the war <laughs> well uh, but that battle up until the Napoleonic until the French Revolution and Napoleonic Wars that was the biggest battle in Europe and yet a few Seven Years' Wars battles that got pretty massive, like um, Kunersdorf, the one that uh, Frederick the Great lost. That was a massive engagement. Prague was big as well. So you can already see the warfare going that way, you know? Right. Um, but yeah, the ability of these armies to, to raise as many men as they can, to fling as many men as they can into battle. I mean, you get to a point where... Um, out of Wagram, they're seeing like 300,000 men on that plane. And then Bordino is bigger than that. No, 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 no. Bordino is not bigger than that. I'm sorry. No, Bordino is not. Bordino is about 250,000. I guess Leipzig would be the biggest single, single battle? battle or? Leipzig would be the biggest. Yeah. Oh, God. I mean, I think... I'm off the top of my head how many men are there, but it's a massive number of men. The casualties are horrendous. There is no battle comparable to Leipzig until the First World War. Nothing battle and god the casualty rate at waterloo is horrendous napoleon's got seventy thousand men he's gonna have something like 30 to forty thousand become casualties not in a day in an afternoon 
That is appalling. Yeah. No, it is. Um, pretty horrifying. Uh, you, yeah, you, you can kind of see why Europe for a number of decades just really didn't do a whole lot of warfare. <laughs> Until you get to the Crimean War, and the Crimean War, that's a whole other can of worms there. I'm no expert, and I've only read like a few books here and there, but um, it's an interesting one, too. Crimean War is also fascinating because um, you know a lot of American Civil War historians will be like, "Oh, our war, the Civil War, first war, with trains and and telegraphs and photography and all the stuff they're saying." I'm like, "No, that's the Crimean War." <laughs> yeah, um, I guess one of the issues with the Crimean War was that uh, weren't the British and French worried about the Russians using the rail uh, rail lines to reinforce and move around them? I don't know about that, actually. Um, I don't know about that one. But apparently I, they didn't I actually most... pull that off, but that was one of the worries from what I understand. But then again, I, I think I've read one book on that topic a long time ago. So I read the Orlando Figs book a few years ago, which, by the way, was really fascinating. You know you close the book with? It was, it was published in like 2011 or 12, I want to say. Anyway, he closed the book with talking about how Russians are upset that the Crimea was part of Ukraine and they want it back. Well, uh, that was prescient, huh? He tied it to the Crimean War, and I didn't know this, but for, for the Russian people, if they think of the Crimean War, if they think about it in a proud way, they think of the fact that the army surrounded at Sevastopol stood, withstood that siege for so long, and the British and French lost so many men taking it. So for them, Sevastopol is... I don't want to say necessarily like the Alamo, but something along those lines. Like, we lost, but you gave the other guy hell. You stood right. up, right? And so he's writing about how for them, uh, the fact that Crimea is, there's an emotional connection to Crimea and specifically Sevastopol. And he's, he's essentially predicting the book. He's like, yeah, they're going to try and take it back. <laughs> right. So um, I, let's see. What else did I want to ask you? Okay. Uh, can you also describe some of the future projects that you're working on. I know you have was it two or three books are being published this year, and then there's another one you're in the process of researching and writing. Can you tell us about those? At least Definitely. Briefly? Uh, so I'm with the Emerging Civil War, which is a blog uh, filled with Civil War historians of um, in calibers. Um, it's, it's a good blog to check out. You get lots of nice little information in there. You get um, get a lot of good opinion pieces and lots of bits of odd research, you know. And it's also good because it's not, how can I say, it's not overrun with the hyper-partisanship you find in a lot of Civil War history. I mean, you can get some charged debates on there, but it's mostly pretty civil, I'd say. Anyway, the they have a book series of what are considered advanced introductory books, um, the war for various campaigns and subjects and i've written two for them that are going to be published this year one of them was supposed to be published like two years ago but they had some problems there with um getting people to do book layout so they had to hire people fire people that kind of stuff anyway the second book will be called grant's left hook which is about the bermuda hundred campaign which is uh, when benjamin butler attempts to threaten or at least take richmond if he can and um when he's also taking on, uh, he's also trying to, his main objective really is to tie up as many troops that are going to Robert E. Lee's army and, and that's fighting Grant in the wilderness in Spotsylvania. And there is a short biography of Beauregard because there has been one written since the 50s and I have my own perspective on him that I wanted to put in the book. And um, then the other one is, I'm writing right now that I'm finishing up is a book on the Battle of Nashville and they also want me to do a book on Tullahoma, which was in Tennessee, and that'll be further down the road. My main project I'm working on right now, though, the one that's intensive, is called The Maps of Shiloh. Oh. That's the battle I know in the most detail, the one I'm most obsessed with. And what that is, it's a wonderful series. It, it gives you the narrative of the battle, and on each page you have on the left-hand side of the book the narrative of what's going on, and the right-hand side is a map of what's happening. And this book will have, I want to say, around 120 maps. Wow. And so you can see the Battle of Shiloh unfold piece by piece. 
Yeah, I remember. I, um, I think I went on a trip with you and uh, your brother and one of our other friends down to Shiloh once, and I swear you knew every subordinate officer who was named in that battle. We were walking along, and you were like, "Yeah, here's where uh, Major Jones once said that um, some random brand was the only brand for him." Like these random just uh, facts that were. It's kind of amazing because I don't think you'd been there before, but it seemed like you knew every little uh, inch of the ground somehow. Been there once before, but it'd been a long time. But I, I'd poured over the maps and I'd read every book I could on the subject. Before we went there, man, I had just read read like two books on Shiloh, like within a few months of that trip. Um, so I don't know. It's just one that draws me in. And if you think I knew a lot of facts then, I know way more right now. <laughs> oh, All right. Well, I, know, I, know, I mean, I mean, I mean, this, this series is like on the regimental scale. So I'm doing individual unit movements, and I'm having to go to the official records and use the markers they have at the battle because the battlefield has markers to show you each unit's progression and then you look at that all the primary sources and get a hold of um you know memoirs and regimental histories and everything and just try to piece together where the units are and it's doubly hard with shiloh because you know these units will write things are like oh we crossed a creek and there were some woods and i'm like well that's about everywhere <laughs> Or they're like, there was a big field, and you're like, all right, that's Shiloh. <laughs> yeah. There's also some nasty-looking little pools of water everywhere. Ah, God, that was um, that was a, one of the horrible things about Shiloh was the um, it rained the night of, which that happened a lot in musket combat. Like, it happened in the Waterloo, for instance. And what it is is that you're producing so much smoke from these guns, the smoke rises to the air, Clouds get, I guess, I'm not a scientist, but they get annoyed, I guess you'd say, and then they rain. And so Shiloh had a big, bad rain afterwards. And the men there were, you know, going to pools of water and drinking. And of course, some of them die. And then the guys come up there, they see the corpse, they'll just move it aside. Um, The night of Shiloh, almost every person who lived through it writes about how horrible it was. Even Grant. Which you gotta understand that Grant's memoirs are not particularly emotional. Like he doesn't talk about the suffering of the men much or anything. Right. Wonderful example of that in um, the, the historian William McFeely wrote a great biography of Grant, and he was comparing Grant's account to the Battle of Fort Donelson with Wallace's Lou Wallace, and Lou Wallace had kind of he wrote Ben Hur. He he had creative sensibilities. So his account, he talks about all the bodies that are everywhere lying in the snow. Grant says nothing about that. That said, in Grant's memoir, Shiloh is one of the only battles where he talks about the carnage on the field. Not, not, not for in detail, but the fact that even he talks about it gives you an idea not only of the scale and scope of it, but the shock. There had been no battle that was that bloody until that point. Shiloh gets surpassed by a bunch of other battles, right? Like Stones River, one that people don't really talk about much. Stones River, slightly more casualties than Shiloh, worse casualty rate by percentage. But by that time, the men who fought at Stones River, they've been at Shiloh, they've been at Perryville. Um, they had seen some other horrible battles. They were more used to it. But Shiloh is such a shock, and especially because most of the men on both sides had never been in a battle before. So... Yeah. For that to be your first battle, that is one hell of a baptism of fire. Right. I guess by comparison, something like First Bull Run would have been, uh, you know, warm up exercise. Yeah, yeah. At First Bull Run, you know, not not to downplay it too much, when it's fought, it's the biggest battle fought by Americans at the time, with the most casualties. There's no battle of the American Revolution or the Mexican American War that equals First Bull Run. The First Bull Run is a mean battle and is itself a pretty rough baptism of fire, but it just doesn't equal Shiloh. But I'm not a first bull run expert, but one thing I've read in a few accounts of it is that one thing they think is that the soldiers were so had were, were just they they weren't really used to shooting their muskets that they were overshooting a lot. So there are accounts in first bull run where regiments talk about having the bullets fly over their head, especially in the early part of the battle. So it could be argued that the battle would have probably been worse 
if the men had had more training. Well, By the time you get to Shiloh, these units are generally better trained, better armed. And in the case of the Union, they do have, actually the Confederates do too, but the Union in particular did have some regiments that had saw combat at Belmont and Fort Donaldson. So they had already seen the elephant. And Fort Donaldson's a pretty rough battle too. You know, make no mistake about it. But yeah, just not on the scale of Shiloh, that's all. I see. Okay. Well, um, I think that is a pretty good series intro, and now people kind of have a feel of who you are and what you do, and uh, what kind of works you're uh, working on right now. So I think that more or less accomplishes the objective of an introduction to the Napoleon series. So I think um, we'll end this video and uh, stay on here, Sean, and we'll do something else in a minute. Problem.